we're having uh, pretty much 30 minutes for uh, something that I would hope will be a lively debate. Um, we call this debate uh, uh, end game for jobs, welcome flexible labor. I mean, we did this for a purpose because I believe that if you think from a public policy perspective, the metrics that governments are using to to measure the strength of the economy has always have always been the number of jobs that you create. So that's how you gouge somehow how healthy an economy is. Whereas now flexible labor has been disrupting this. So the metrics need to change. Um, this debate will be framed around four main questions, which are going to read out loud now. What work will be? How work will be done? Where work will be done? And what workers will do? So I would ask each of you in one or maximum two minutes time to give a very quick reflection on this or a final thought or a final takeaway on the basis of what you learned during the other spe speeches. So I'd like to start with uh, Sara. Does this work? So um, I studied labor as an undergraduate in college, if you can actually believe it. And I remember that we were having like some conversation not like this, but kind of what, what is organizational behavior? And we had to write some complicated paper. And I decided not to write that paper and do something radical and write this paper called Why Work? And um, I did well on that paper, I just want to say, which I thought was a tribute to the professor. But I think we're kind of at this same point to ask that question. So we want to talk about metrics, but I think that not only do we know that the jobs and work numbers are wrong, but I think that we're asking the wrong fundamental questions for the assumptions. So let me just put it to you this way. So when I started my talk, if some of you were here in the morning, we did a study with um, what's now called Upwork, um, Elance Odesk, and said in the United States, it's 53 million Americans. And what we did is we were getting very frustrated with the way the United States was counting the number of workers. And so we basically said, if you're not going to count them, we will. And the numbers just were vastly different. So the government was saying it was about 8% of the workforce. We were saying it was you know, one in three. Into it, IBM, all these other big companies and their predictions were saying that uh, it was going to be in, in that direction. And in fact, the government in the United States just, uh, is today the 20th? Uh, no, sure. Uh, Whatever. It, two days ago just came out with new numbers basically saying it's in this vicinity. So I think that it shows that you need to start having the power of politics and other things to start to reframe this. So I think that's number one about mm. reframing the metrics. But I think the second piece is what are the underlying assumptions and what I think we're headed toward is a society and economy where we are not just going to be working in this same way, not to totally agree with uh, Airbnb dude, but you know, really it's going to be something where it's going to be bite-sized pieces of work for revenue, perhaps a lot of revenue, a lot of sh uh, bartering, sharing, and I think that is going to become very difficult to measure. And just to finally say this, the biggest implication that I see that's a huge economic factor is our GDP. Gross domestic product is a big driver is how people are spending. And people are, we're, we usually equate work, salary, spend, mm. growth. And that linear equation is going to soon be also disrupted. Right. You know, in France, they are using now the happiness index as a replacement of GDP. It was an idea of Sarkozy, I think. Um, Shelby, I have a question for you. I think there's a number of uh, there's a growing number of sharing economy companies now that they're using a cooperative uh, and and workers-owned model. Uh, I wonder if you give, 
can give a few thoughts on that, and particularly on what kind of uh, public-private partnership perhaps are needed for these systems to succeed. Um, sure. Well, you know, I mean, I guess um, uh, I, I heard sort of like two different questions there. One was around, you know, my thoughts on the cooperative structures, and the second one was around sort of what uh, are, are you asking what public private partnerships are needed in order to make the cooperatives succeed? Well, it's in fact, it was actually two questions into one for okay. you to choose. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let's see. Um, you know, maybe I'll talk more on the, the public private partnerships. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, really to, uh, to empower this, this new class of worker, you know, Sarah just mentioned how, you know, workers becoming very bite sized. Um, uh, it, it's a lot about flexibility. People are, are choosing. Uh, the different ways that they're going to be earning income. Uh, they're finding uh, lots of um, security and redundancy from having uh, multiple sources of income. They're not reliant on, uh, on one job. So, um, you know, what do you need to, to really em empower those workers? I think uh, you know, the first thing that you need is, um, is new protections. So I, I, I spoke earlier about um, some of my thoughts on that, uh, not just putting people into old structures and old protections, but rethinking this in a modern context. Um, the second thing that I think you need um, uh, is uh, you need to help people learn from each other. Um, you know, I think the, the Freelancers Union is, is doing a, uh, you know, a, a great job on this, um, you know, where they're producing really great content, uh, helping people understand how to make this work in their life. So some of these things are sort of vocational, helping people understand how to do their jobs better. But a lot of it's you know, uh, helping people understand how to make this work in their life. Mm. Um, you know, how do I balance these different uh, these different income streams? Um, uh, you know, how, how do I uh, how do I float myself during during uh, the valleys and and how do I save during the peaks? Um, uh, and the last thing is giving workers a voice. So particularly in these. Um, uh, in the context of, the, of these big platforms like you know Airbnb and Uber, um, you know the you know, the worker can become very small and, and the voice can become lost. And so, um, uh, you know, finding a way to to identify and amplify that voice, I think, is is something that's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Can you give the microphone to Epi? Yeah. I have a question right. for you. Um, I don't think we're going to see any soon a 100% contingent workforce. So. What's going to happen is more, it will be a hybrid workforce where you will have uh, full-time employees, you will have freelancers, and more and more you will see on-demand or micro-tasking and so on. So I wonder, how the, does this evolving workforce could coexist together? How to collectively harness the intelligence of this massive and very diverse workforce? Yeah, I mean, think about, for example, um, you know, what really means um, today and tomorrow to have that opportunity of Peter Thiel had 10 years ago when he invested that $500,000 to Facebook, right? This is what really, really need to really focus. So it's not just about jobs coming to us, but also other opportunities, including investments coming to us. And so now we're part of this big pie that will really develop to something bigger and greater. Yeah. So the fact of the matter that, you know, how we really redesign a system that this goes as a funnel, that everyone is part of it and taking that action to it and being, being in that system, it's not just really a platform itself. We have a great example that we found this community out of all the way north of Sweden, um, and they were like a community of less than 1,000 people. Uh, they invented crowdsourcing and crowdfunding before the crowdsourcing and crowdfunding term even was coined. So the fact of the matter that is really like if we're really going to have ethical leaders who are really pushing these platforms, you know, then we need to really start to really see how these, how these people can be part of it and can take, uh, can really, we can empower them. That's the only way to do it. Right. We cannot drive these platforms with the VC drug. I had this conversation with Lisa Gansky all the time. It is not about really that just going and really build a big valuation. Big valuation, it's people. We need to design things for these people and we need to have that commitment. So that's how I think. There's, <laughs> there's nothing more people-centric than the wish are fast, so you are in the right place. I have an observation perhaps, but maybe I turn it to a question to Nicola, if I may. I noticed that uh, uh, a lot of sharing economy companies are 
always trying to keep their costs low to their users. But they're having problems to, just because of that, they're having problems to motivate their workforce, to, to train their workforce. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, or if not, uh, anything on the future of work, or uh, you have a microphone? Yeah. Uh, well. Thank you. Um, Actually, uh, since uh, entrepreneurs in the so-called sharing economy or on-demand economy are operating platforms, by definition, a platform is a two-sided business model where you have to serve both suppliers and customers. And uh, the balance between the two can be very different from one market to another. In certain, uh, obviously, you, you serve customers who are, the, who are paying, but sometimes, uh, uh, the, the critical fights are to, to, to make sure that the suppliers are right on time, uh, able to, to, to deliver the service. Uh, we all know that uh, in the war that, uh, that's waged between uh, Uber and Lyft in the US, the problem is not finding the, the customers. Everybody wants to be driven, by, uh, uh, wants to have a hard ride uh, with whatever driver you can find in a few minutes. Mm. The, the critical problem is to find the drivers because the more drivers you have, the, the, the largest geographical perimeter you can serve and, uh, and, and the shorter the, the time you can offer to the customers in terms of uh, yeah. uh, when will the car arrive to, to take you home. Uh, and basically, uh, those companies are showing us uh, how you invest, you know, in attracting a workforce, in retaining a workforce, uh -huh. um, in training, training it, and it's not easy, and it's not um, it, it's not always a pleasure for the people working on those platforms because you there's constant competition. You have to manage your reputation. If a customer is unhappy, you have a bad rate. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it will impair, uh, uh, sometimes for a long time, your capacity to find the b better customers on the platform. And so it's hard, it's competitive. Um, and uh, to succeed, I think you have both to put the pressure on the suppliers, but also to make sure that, uh, to empower them to, to get better, and because it ultimately creates value, and the value of your platform is, is obviously both the people that are supplying whatever you want to provide and the customers that are faithful and are, that are willing to co-create the value because uh, that's what we do in the digital yeah. economy. Everybody works either uh, as a user or as, or as a worker. Thanks for that. Can you give the microphone to your neighbor? <laughs> Antonio. Uh, difficult question for you um, about exploitation. I hear it all the time, and there are even recent articles about the sharing economy being sued to death. So how to avoid this exploitation and improve the security of the workers, considering a context of, uh, of evolving peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces? Okay, uh, to me, the first concern is to frame the very idea, the very notion of labor. I've been uh, uh, listening to a lot of people just, you know, uh, opposing full-time versus contingent jobs. Now, to me, the dichotomy which is uh, relevant is between implicit and explicit labor, or if you prefer, between visible and invisible labor. Uh, what we've been witnessing uh, in uh, uh, the last few years is something that really resounds with what happened uh, in the 1970s, where a strong uh, women's movement started uh, recognizing that, for instance, all the invisible uh, work of uh, housewives had to be made visible again, you know? And what is happening now around digital platforms, to me, is something that reminds that, in a way, there are a number of persons who say, hey, look at all, at all the actions, at all the behaviors, at all the things we do that actually produce labor. Mm -hmm. This is implicit, in a way, but it has to be recognized. In a way, it has to be made explicit. And in a way, when I, when I talk about digital labor, this is the effort. Now, to come to your uh, question, 
what can we do mm. to help laborers in this situation? Well, the first thing is a, a struggle for recognition, a struggle to define the very, uh, the very perimeter of labor. What is visible, what is invisible, what is explicit, what is implicit? And the idea is to make everything explicit, as explicit as possible, even in terms of working conditions, even in terms of safety, even in terms of, uh, well, terms of contract, mm. and even in terms of, in some cases, of remuneration. Now, when it comes to being paid, to tell you the truth, I am uh, uh, probably more on the basic income side. I know that Nicola is not mm. on, you know, on this part of the debate, but uh, why am I uh, defending this idea? The idea of an, an unconditional, universal basic income, to me, is related to the fact that there is a widespread, implicit productivity of everyone in this society. Right. Everybody is working, babies are working, people die in, in Hospital beds, they are working in a way, and they have to receive, uh, they have to receive some kind of remuneration. Not only the able-bodied 20 to 65, who usually, traditionally, has been defined as the workforce, deserve to be, uh, you know, to be paid. And this, the idea is basically that we now have a, a historical uh, chance to widen the very scope of labor and widen the very scope of social protection and widen the very scope also of remuneration yeah. for our production. I like, I like your point about definitions. I mean, uh, looking at the uh, European countries, there's no harmonized definition of what self-employment is, for example. I mean, each country defines self-employment from their legal or taxation legislation, creates a lot of imbalance if you're working cross-border. And I see that there's a lot of focus on what self-employment is not, but not on what self-employment is. So definition, I, I, I'm a man of definition, I like that. A question to you from, from a freelancer's perspective, as I am a freelancer myself. So I wanted to ask you, what, what does it take for these collaborative forms of, uh, of, of self-employment or of working to scale? And what does a freelancer really need to do to prosper in, in, in a constantly crowded environment these days? Well, I think that the first thing that you have to do is concentrate on value and break away from the main constraint and value of the worker, of, of, excuse me, of the freelancer, which is the freelancer himself. We are limited by our own body, we are finite. And we have a limited resource, which is time, that we cannot expand uh, forever. So if you limit yourself to work on an hourly basis, you're screwed, basically. So what you have to do is whatever you do as a freelancer, you have to turn it into a product where what you sell is the value, not the hours of work you spend in it. For that, you stay as an employee and you get paid to work eight to five for the hours uh, that you're pay paid for. And then what you have to do is try to pull with other professionals like you, with other freelancers like you, bring resources together, make sure that you work with people that you can trust, that are going to be delivering on time what they say they're going to do for the projects, and then bringing those things together, ultimately grow the revenue for the whole pool of, or, li or a limited group of uh, freelancers. By yourself, the only thing you can do is improve your marketing and sales, but that's uh, all the improvements you do, there's a moment where they're going to limit themselves or lower themselves because everybody else is going to be better at sales and marketing. And then ultimately, the main thing is to keep your clients. New clients are very expensive to get, and very, it t takes a lot of time to get new clients and to train new clients to work with you. Keep, try to keep as many of your clients as possible so that way your life will be easier and you will be making much more uh, yeah. revenue. And who's going to train the freelancers? I mean, employees have free training from their companies, but the freelancers are. They have to shop around in the market. That's but myself as an employee, before I turned into being a freelancer, I educated myself a lot. It oh. was the company educated me somewhat, but it was me and my thirst of, of knowledge and wanting to do things better yes. that ended up building my value that I 
was able to use as a freelancer afterwards. Okay, very good, thank you. May I introduce you my colleague uh, William, who is going to tell you something now. Hello, um, I'm William from Mutinery, co-working space in Paris, which uh, I co-founded uh, three years and a half ago, and I found also Mutinery Village in the countryside, co-working place in the countryside, some of you know already. And yeah, it's just to know if you had some question to ask to, to those guys uh, about what you learned or other questions. Uh, we have time only for one question, so it needs to be a really, really important burning, <laughs> burning uh, okay. uh, him, the chosen one. There is uh, something that I would like to hear from, from you guys that have, almost hasn't been mentioned. So when you talk about workers' remuneration, you have a direct rem remuneration when what you get from your salary. But it's also the indirect remuneration that comes from your social benefits, from, uh, from the taxes that the, the economy pr generates, that then you get, you get back as a, at a citizen, as a citizen. So this, in the digital economy, is shrinking. The economy has a size that does not need to uh, end up in, in cuts. You know, the economy is still growing. The digital economy is simply not contributing to the indirect uh, remuneration of, of, of labor. Thank you. Well, um, I can begin. I wrote a lot about that. So. <laughs> uh, actually, the problem is that the tax system is one of the many institutions that we have to reinvent for a new way of creating value. What the welfare state is uh, uh, not adapted anymore to the risks to, uh, to which people are exposed. But also, the tax system is not adapted anymore to the way companies create value. And uh, the demonstration I made in a report commissioned by the French government two years ago with one, uh, one colleague was that as the economy grows more digital, either uh, the institutions remain the same and the tax base will shrink down to zero and there will be nothing left to tax, or we reinvent the tax system gradually, because we don't know uh, uh, how to do it. Uh, so we have to experiment at a small scale uh, uh, how, to, you know, how to tax those platforms that are more and more operated from abroad. That's one thing. How to tax those people who are more and more making money on a on-demand platform without you know, the, uh, an employer as, as a trusted third party to to, to make sure that you uh, uh, about how how many uh, how, how much money you you earned uh, last last month or last year, so that has to be reinvented. But you cannot do it obviously without the governments, and you can you can't do it without the willingness of the taxpayers to comply because uh, a tax system doesn't uh, work uh, with enforcement only. It works mostly. Uh, thanks to the willingness of people to be taxed. That's the basis of the system. And the problem is that uh, the tax systems are, are mostly national tax systems, uh, depending on national governments' uh, measures. And more and more, um, the digital economy is going global. Uh, it's, well, global platforms on which individuals, individual people are working. And so, uh, in between, uh, where, where are the governments that, that can take care of those two extremities, the global platforms and the individuals uh, that don't want to be taxed because uh, life is hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're still waiting for the welfare state to cover us, so uh, while we're waiting, we don't want to pay for the old public services that are not in line with, what, with our needs today. So. Um, in between, you have the OECD or the European Union, but those are too difficult to govern. It's uh, very long to install consensus about what should be done. So we have to wait for you know 
political entrepreneurs who will invent the tax system of tomorrow, who will invent the social insurance for tomorrow, and find a way to bring the money in to, you know, to develop uh, those new institutions that are needed to cover people. I don't know if this is working, but I wanted to take this in a different direction, if that's okay. Or were you going to ask another question? No, it was a one question, so you, okay. you can uh, develop you know, on that. I, I, think that, I think that's totally right, that as you were calling it, policy entrepreneurs will come and start to see what the new realities on the ground are and the new political constituencies. But I think one thing that's been so interesting that we've been talking about for the last three days is these ideas of new currencies and new kinds of economic systems that don't involve the traditional financial transaction that which A, provides margin and B, gets taxed. And so, you know, what I think we're really starting to see is local communities coming together and starting to figure out more sophisticated ways to barter or to couch surf or to do all these other things that are going to be below the, below the radar for right now. And I think it's kind of like what you were talking about as well in terms of, you know, what's the invisible part, what's the visible part. And I think that's the part that's going to really explode because as there will be less and less work that is paid for traditionally, people will still have to have babysitters and have their house is painted, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we can't even imagine. And I think it's really part and parcel of the fact that that part will not be VC funded, I don't think, or, uh, or perhaps somebody will and they'll create that platform and won't that be interesting. But I do think that we're gonna see this be much more locally based and I think that, uh, I think we will be surprised by that innovation. And like you were talking about that community. I'd just like to add something. It's very important to really see, like, okay, uh, how are we really bringing these type of opportunities to the people, okay? So, you know, Jeremy Rifkin talks about the uh, now uh, a million people becoming bankers, right? Um, how many banks we have today, okay? Gang of fours. These are the next big banks right around the corner. It's important to understand that the future should be a billion people becoming bankers. This is where the, and now, now you start to see this distribution of powers, where, because in the end, power corrupts. If I have all that power, even though I'm a very ethical guy, if I get that power, I'll get corrupted. That's a human, we have to understand that. But if we're going to distribute that, I will not be able to get corrupted. This is the key. Also, the other thing that we have to understand, Energy is the most important thing that we have, okay? When you look at it, the most political powers, that greed that comes is because of the energy, okay? Yet, we fail to understand that 80% of that energy that really affects the whole society in the world, it comes for that greed that pretty much a lot of that is being wasted. Wasted. 66% of electricity is being wasted. So when you think back, for example, what Airbnb does in that. Every time I went to the hotel, guess what? I always left the TV on and I left my, 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 my everything on because I didn't care. But today when I go and I live for two years on Airbnb, guess what? I turn everything off when I leave that apartment. So it really brings us a different behavior User experience is the key that we have to really design here. And I think this is what's something that is missing. It's also missing with like the guys, again, like this VC drug. We got to get away with crowdfunding is the way to go if we're going to really have this embedded into the economic system. We have to give this value to the people. Again, everything goes back to the people these days, and we have to design that first. That's all. And uh, may I add that at the origin of, of all of the welfare state, the welfare state wasn't invented by politicians who de deployed a whole national system. It was invented on the ground by local communities, factory workers, or small business owners who uh, decided together to, to fund a mutual, uh, to, a mutual fund to cover for, their, uh, for accidents or uh, loss of revenue. And that was uh, repli replica replicated 
in a mandatory national system much later. But what we see now on the ground in local communities is probably a, a, a good view of what will we be, be deployed ultimately um, at, a, at a national or even global scale to take care of, peop uh, of people and the risks they are exposed to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I can't refuse uh, Diana on the last question uh, you wanted to ask. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, you have been talking a lot about e the economic approach of work and um, traditionally we uh, talk about the, the two scenarios, either innovation will create new jobs that will like solve all the problems and create value or jobs will be completely destroyed in uh, more or less long term. But what happens to, uh, to uh, what we observe today is that actually jobs don't disappear, that the jobs that are created are service jobs, that like more or less slave jobs. They create no value, they are not efficient, uh, they are just made like what, what Graeber called bullshit job. They just are here to maintain people doing something because the society, from a very sociological and cultural point of view, can't provide any other activity that, um, that allows people to be uh, involved, engaged in the society. So maybe it's more, um, not only, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, this series Black Mirror, you have one film where guys keep peddling to earn like credits that are actually spent on advertisement that it couldn't like switch. So uh, this is quite a dystopic point of view, and for me, it's maybe the most, uh, the most, um, yeah, that what's going to happen in the f in the next uh, in the next years maybe. So what is the more political, cultural, and sociological solution that we have uh, to uh, to change this way of like engaging people only through jobs and reinventing the way we engage through political activities, other things. And it's not an economic question. I think this is a, a view that is a bit too simplified. Um, you can, we all try to make things as simple as possible to understand them and to discuss them, but sometimes we go overboard and we simplify too much things that are too complicated and that ends up leading to wrong processes of discussion. Um, when you're talking about these service process, uh, jobs that deliver no value, they do. If not, they will not be kept. They will not exist. Um, when the, the way you talk about working, like if it was some kind of like life imprisonment, uh, it may be for some people because they don't have the courage or they're in a situation where psychologically they cannot take um, the decision to change it. But for most people, it is not the case. Most people are happy with their work, and they're happy with the life they have. And um, that's not, the, that's, that's not see really what, what is making things change. There's, a lot of, there's something that is clear that we are living in a, in a paradigm change where there's a lot of work, but jobs are not following. And this is not the first time we've suffered this in the economy. And where we, where we have had uh, historically very big disparities between revenue of the top layers and the lower layers. Um, if we look at the Industrial Revolution, the first decades only created abuse, poverty for the masses, and a lot of money for the ones that were controlling it. It was after a while that the things changed enough, thanks to the work of all those workers and also of people that took the courage to be representing those co those 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 uh, workers as in their own um, factories, as union representatives, as politicians themselves, they are also people. You know, politicians are not are, are a separate race. They are people like you and I that decide to take a stand and that decide to move on and try to change things through politics. And it's thanks to those people that we manage to change the world. The good thing is that now. We have something that nobody had at the time, is the capacity to communicate and to learn. The difference with the capacity to reach out and the, to learn quickly a lot of things and to develop our own process of thought independently, it's my, much greater today than it ever was. And that's something that is helpful to contribute towards this better future. I mean, just one more thing that I want to add to this. You know, it's, it's, it's time that we need to start 
rewarding the givers. You know, more you give, you creating these, and, and not to uh, to 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 reward these takers, and not to make them celebrities that are taking our 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 resources and our our our, our future. And I think this is very important to really just go for it and really reward these uh, givers. Does anyone else have any other comments? I think we questions? don't have uh, much time now. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all the speakers. Thank it was you. really great. Round of applause. Big round of applause for them. Yeah.